Like a lot of people, the early days of winter are really tough on my immune system. I seem to always get sick either when the temperature takes its first big dip or when we get our first big snowfall. This past winter, I got so sick that I actually had to call into work, which I have only had to do one other time in my career. My wife left for work at about 8am that day and I passed out on the couch shortly after. I was up for most of the night, so this was some much needed sleep. I woke up a couple of minutes after 10 with my throat sore and dry and my head congested and pounding. I laid there for a minute trying to muster up the strength to get off the couch to get something to drink. I walked to the kitchen and got a cup of juice and a cup of ginger ale. On my way back to the couch, I walked by our living room window and noticed a light snowfall on the ground that must have accumulated while I was asleep. I stared for a minute, admiring the snow and taking a chance to stretch my legs before I returned to the couch for the majority of the day. Right before I turned back to the couch, I noticed footprints that started from the bottom of the driveway and went towards the wooden gate that led to our backyard. At first, I thought maybe they were for my wife. However, there wasn't snow on the ground when I fell asleep and when she went to work, so these tracks had to be fairly new. I went back into the kitchen and looked out the window into the backyard. I saw the footprints continue in the backyard and also noticed that the wooden gate was ajar, even though it was shut and closed with a padlock nightly. I threw my robe on and opened the sliding glass door to peek my head out and see if I could see anything else. The cold breeze and snow on my face only made me feel more ill and made me want to retire back to the couch. But then I immediately got a rush of adrenaline, seeing that one of my small basement windows was also ajar and left completely open. I now was in a state of panic and trying to think rationally or explain the situation to myself. My wife would never have opened the wooden gate or the basement window. No animal could have done this. The only logical explanation is that someone was in or trying to get into my house. I exited the kitchen and walked down the hall and peeked my head around the staircase that led down into the basement. The stairs had traces of snow and puddles of water on them. Trying to think quick on my feet, I quietly but briskly got into the nearest closet and called the police for my cell phone. I tried to whisper not knowing where the intruder was or if they were even still in my house. Luckily, the 911 operator was able to hear me and told me to remain quiet until someone was able to arrive at my house for assistance. She remained on the line with me as I heard someone come down the stairs from the second level of our house. It seemed like the person was walking around looking for something specific, walking by the closet door several times at a fast pace. I was doing my best to hold in any sniffle, sneeze, or cough that I thought was coming in order to remain silent and undetected. I remember thinking I didn't care what the person took. They could take anything they wanted, I just wanted to remain unharmed. After what felt like hours, but in reality was probably only a couple of minutes, I heard the whoop whoop of sirens outside. The cops knocked on the door and after a few attempts, must have come around back and entered through the now unlocked sliding glass door. Even though the police made their presence known, the intruder was still in the house. They arrested him and brought him out of the house. I didn't really hear much of a struggle. I just heard them say to get down and put your hands behind your head. I honestly just stayed where I was and didn't move until the cops opened the closet door and told me that it was alright to exit. Apparently the burglar hadn't tried to steal anything, or at least didn't have anything of mine on his person. But upon further inspection of the man's vehicle, it looked like he had broken into several houses in the neighborhood and taken packages and other valuables from their homes. The police did find a knife on him, but they told me they didn't believe he had intentions of using it. I think they said this just to make me feel better as I don't know how they would have known this person's intentions. My wife as well as myself were obviously shaken up by this ordeal. I can't put into words for those of you reading the story what effects an incident like this can have on you after the fact. Of course you're scared in the moment, but ever since this has happened I find it difficult to feel safe, to feel like my family is safe. It's a terrible feeling to not feel protected in your own home. We have since moved from that neighborhood but the feelings of insecurity still remain. I have taken more proactive steps to try and ensure this doesn't happen again. We have state-of-the-art locks for our windows and doors, as well as a new security system. 
I also have an Akita guard dog to protect the house when I'm not home. As traumatizing as this event was, I'm still grateful that I woke up when I did and that something worse didn't happen. Growing up and spending my entire life in the northeastern United States, I can confidently say that I'm no stranger to snow and driving in the snow. If you're from a similar climate, I'm sure you would agree that driving in the snow is both annoying and dangerous. I live in a city where we are consistently in the top 10 for nationwide snowfall each year. Dealing with this much inclement weather each year has turned me into a pretty good driver in the snow, or at least that's what I thought. On a night in February a few years ago, I was driving home from my girlfriend's house. It was 8pm and had been snowing for a majority of the day. I went over there to shovel out her driveway and make sure it was as clear as possible for her to get up and go to work the next morning. It usually took me about 10 to 15 minutes to get to or from her house, but so far this drive had taken 30 minutes and I was a little over halfway home. The roads and highways were empty for the most part, but I was forced to go slower than normal as I didn't want my car to get stuck or go off the side of the road. I had made it off the final highway and now I just had side roads until I got back to my house. I was approaching an intersection, I think one that had a four-way stop, and of course after I stopped and tried to start again my car began fishtailing and wouldn't move. At this point I was pretty tired and started to get frustrated. I hadn't been home from work yet and really just wanted to get out of this car and weather. I tried rocking the car back and forth in the snow but it wasn't working. I was digging myself a deeper hole and probably taking some of the tread off my tires. I didn't know what to do, if I should call someone for help, try and dig myself out by hand. I certainly wasn't asking one of my family or friends to come out and try to help. I decided to get out of the car and try to kick some of the snow out from beneath my tires hoping to regain traction on the road. As I was trying to dig out my tires a random woman came up to me. She didn't say anything or offer me help or ask what was going on. She just stood there and stared at me. She began walking towards the stop sign with her hood now over her head. I shouted, Hey, are you okay? Do you need anything? She didn't answer. I was a little weirded out but mostly annoyed with my car and was focused on that. After a few minutes on my hands and knees using my snow brush to move snow out from under my tires... I got up to get back into my car. I saw the lady standing in the same spot and I yelled out, Okay, well, have a good night then. Probably sounding sarcastic and annoyed as I was in a crappy mood. Right as I opened my door to get back into the car, she finally spoke up and said, Wait. In a monotone voice. I continued to open my door and looked at the woman waiting for her to say something else. Then, in an eerie, unsettling, and almost manic voice, she said, That is my car! Not wanting any part of the situation and the obvious crazy person 30 feet away from me, I got into my car and closed the door. I started the car and again began to rock myself out of the snow, and then I noticed that the woman was now standing in front of my car, probably close enough to touch the hood with outstretched hands. If I tried to floor it and drive, I would easily have ran her over, so I started to honk my horn and put the car in reverse. She moved after a few honks, but came over to the driver's side door and started pulling at the handle. The doors were locked, but I was obviously still scared and confused as to what was going on. This is when things started to turn for the worse. She became aggressive and started to beat on the door, screaming loudly, This is my car, you beast! She kept referring to me as a beast or the beast and insisting I was in her car. Completely freaked out, I tried to floor it and thank God, I was finally able to fishtail out of that spot and move forward up the road. I looked back in my rearview mirror and the lady was running after the car, waving her arms in the air. I tried my best to forget about the incident and to not dwell on what the intent or reason for it was. Either way crazy beastmaster snow lady. Let's not meet again.
For a little bit of context, this story took place when I was 19 years old. I am currently 28 and no longer live in the state where this occurrence took place. When I was 19, I worked at a gas station convenience store that was only a few minutes away from my house. I was enrolled in community college, so most of my shifts were evening or overnights. For the most part, the job was normal and boring. We didn't really get many customers during the later hours, and if we did, they usually pumped their gas, paid with a credit card, and were on their way. I decided to pick up some extra hours during our holiday break from school. I figured I could use the extra cash to get Christmas presents for my family. I was scheduled to work three overnight shifts in a row, which was a pain, because I always found it difficult to fall asleep when I got home in the morning. The first night of my overnight stretch was going by pretty uneventfully. I was biding my time by restocking the shelves and facing the products that had gaps in them. I remember I was bringing out a big box of cosmic brownies to fill our display case when I heard the bell ring and someone enter the store. It was around 2 or 3 a.m., so I dropped what I was doing and headed behind the register to assist the person. I hadn't seen them yet, but yelled out good evening to see if I would get a response. I didn't hear anything, so I proceeded to move behind the register to see if the person needed assistance. When I got a glimpse of the person, it looked to be an elderly woman with dark black hair. Her face was covered in wrinkles, but it was hard to really make out anything else as she was bundled up pretty tight due to the cold weather. I saw her moving slowly throughout the aisles, not seemingly looking for anything but just walking throughout the store. After several minutes of watching her do this, I decided to ask if there was anything I could assist her with. She didn't even bother to look at me or acknowledge that she heard me. She just continued to pace throughout the store. After another five minutes or so, she suddenly stopped and stared at the clock that was above the cooler. Turned around and scampered out the door and disappeared into the night. To be honest, I didn't really think much of it. I assumed she was homeless and was possibly just trying to get some relief from the cold. We weren't technically supposed to let people loiter in or around the store, but this occurrence seemed pretty harmless to me. The next night... I was sitting behind the counter getting pretty drowsy, wishing the sun would come up so that I could go home and try to get some rest. I was watching a TV show on my iPad around, I think, 4am when I heard the bell ring. I'm pretty sure I jumped out of my chair as I was not paying attention and dozing in and out of sleep. Startled and trying to regain my composure, I looked at the door to see who had entered and it was the same woman from the night before. She looked almost exactly the same except now there seemed to be several scrapes or scratches on her face. I greeted her and asked if there was anything I could help her with. Again, no response, and she began the process of walking up and down the aisles with her head down. I figured I was going to have to wait a minute or two and then let her know that if she wasn't planning on buying anything, then she would have to leave the store. Once a few minutes passed and I informed her, she stopped directly where she was standing stared at me and said, The only thing worth bargaining for is your soul. Her voice was high and shrill and not at all what I expected. I responded by saying, Excuse me? And she didn't say anything else. She just stared at me with a menacing, almost aggressive look. After about 30 seconds, she exited the store and I watched her walk across the parking lot, hoping she wouldn't come back. The final night of my consecutive overnights came all too quickly, and all I could think about was hoping that this crazy woman wouldn't show up again tonight. I never really had anxiety related to this job, so for the first time, I was uneasy about heading into work. I couldn't really focus on anything during my shift other than staring at the door and waiting for customers to enter. I didn't really leave the register even though I probably could have done some stocking throughout the store. The clock seemed to be moving so slow, it was only 3 a.m. and I felt like I had been there for 12 hours. Shortly after 3 a.m. I heard the bell ring and there she was, the same woman from the two previous nights. She looked even more disheveled and the cuts on her face had increased and were also noticeable on her hands. Her hands almost seemed red like they were smeared with blood. I looked over to her and yelled out, Are you okay? Can I get you some help? Meanwhile, really only concerned with my own safety. She looked up in my direction and mouthed the words, Help me. 
and looked like she started to cry. I told her to hold on and went down to my purse to grab my cell phone to contact someone. I found my cell phone and was getting ready to dial 911, but then I heard the bell go and the door open, and when I looked up, she was gone. I didn't even see her scurry across the parking lot, it was that quick. I decided to call my boss not knowing what else to do. I had clearly woke him up, but he seemed attentive when I explained what transpired during the previous three nights. He decided to come in and talk to me and check the property to see if we could locate her. When he arrived, he decided to go to the back and check the video recordings to see if he could get a visual or a description on the person in case we decided to contact the authorities that someone had entered our store, clearly in trouble and not in the right mental state. He came back up front about 10 minutes later and had a scowl on his face. Hand me the phone, I'm calling the cops. He said in a very serious tone. What? I asked, startled, slightly worried that she might be back. Come look at this. He said, leading me back to the surveillance room. He proceeded to rewind the footage that was overlooking the back of the building, near the bathrooms. Upon playing it, I watched as the old woman walked onto screen facing directly towards the store. Seemingly out of nowhere, her slow demeanor became explosive as she began aggressively thrusting her shoulders into the bricks of the building, falling to her knees and intermittently scratching at her face and the store. She proceeded in this psychotic state for nearly two minutes straight before she wandered off screen towards the front of the store and entering towards me. The timing lined up directly with when I remembered seeing her. I was in mild shock, with my hand over my mouth as my boss informed me about experiences he's had with various junkies in the past, explaining that some of them seem borderline possessed without rhyme or reason for their actions. We ended up reporting the incidents and showing the footage to a few patrolmen, but there wasn't much they could do besides reassuring us that they'd keep an officer patrolling the area for the next couple evenings. The way that woman moved still baffles my mind, based on the difference when I saw her demeanor when she walked in. Looking back, her asking for help really made me wish there was something I could have done for her. But needless to say, I haven't worked night shift for quite some time. I wanted to share this story that happened to me and a group of friends a few years ago. First let me give you a little backstory on what we used to do for fun. My friends and I loved playing outside during the winter time. Our parents didn't mind how long we were outside and it was the best time of year for some of our favorite games. Our twin friends, let's call them Ava and Andy for the sake of the story, have a beautiful home with tons of land on the property. There were at least five acres of forest that were located directly on the property behind the house. When we got together at their house, we would all play games like manhunt or even just hide and seek if we couldn't decide on anything specific. So on the day of this occurrence, we all gathered at Ava and Andy's house to play hide and seek. We had a snow day from school and my parents brought a bunch of us over so we could hang out and play for the day. The group decided to play hide and seek, so my friend Danielle and I decided to go and hide in the woods which was a pretty common hiding spot for our games. We decided to run out further than we usually did, but we weren't worried as it was daytime and we always made sure we could see the exit to the woods so we wouldn't get lost. We began making our way back and started to veer pretty far left, hoping we could see whoever came in looking after us and make our exit before we were caught. However, we noticed what looked like to be a small wooden structure, a mix between an outhouse and a smaller shed. We walked up to it for a closer look and had to kick some snow and ice off the door to try and open it. Once we got the door open, we saw that hanging on the walls was an assortment of all sorts of traps, or I guess that's what they looked like to me. They really didn't look like anything I had seen before, so my best guess was traps of some sort. They were all metal and had what looked to be blood or maybe some dark rust on them. To be honest with you, the first thing I thought of looking at this room was that it was straight out of the movie Saw. Just a bunch of contraptions that looked like they would be used with sinister intentions. We immediately shut the door and made our way back to the house through the woods, not caring if we lost the game of hide and seek. 
Once we got back to the house, we asked Ava and Andy, Hey, do you know that there is a creepy shed in the woods on your property, filled with some pretty weird stuff? Andy responded, Oh yeah, that's just our dad's hunting stuff. He doesn't like keeping it in the house, so he keeps it out there. Danielle and I kind of just dismissed it and let it go, but I still felt a little disturbed and unsettled about it. My dad has hunted my entire life, and I have never seen him with any equipment that even resembled what I saw in that shed. That night, I let curiosity get the better of me, and I tried to Google some of these traps I saw in the forest. I searched for a pretty long time, but really couldn't find anything that matched the mental picture that I had in my mind. The next weekend, we went back to Ava and Andy's house. After a few hours of sitting in the living room, drinking hot chocolate, and just hanging out, we decided to play manhunt again. Just as Danielle and I were going outside, Ava and Andy's father confronted the two of us. Heard you found my shed, he said in a somber sounding voice. We kind of just nodded and smiled, at least that's what I remember doing. He then bent his neck down to us aggressive and said, That's my shed. Don't go in there again, and if I find you out there, there will be trouble. And then he walked away from us into another room. This was weird because their father was always super nice and treated us with a lot of respect, so this seemed to be way out of character for him. As we joined the rest of our friends outside, I went and hid myself to try and get a look at the shed from a distance, hoping no one else would know. But when I got close enough to see, I could make out three different industrial-sized padlocks on the door that hadn't been there previously. I'm still not sure what those traps were, or what they were used for. Was he just looking out for us kids' safety, or was he hunting something other than animals? I live in the northern United States, a state that lies on the Canadian border. In my hometown there is an abandoned military base, or at least it's supposed to be abandoned. Back when I was in high school, my friends and I would always hear all sorts of stories saying that it wasn't actually abandoned, and that dangerous cults met or even lived in the abandoned buildings, or that the homeless population had taken over the abandoned compound to get some shelter from the cold. Pretty much any and all bizarre stories you can think of could be attached to this military base. Anyway, one frigid January night, my three friends and myself decided we were going to try and locate the base to explore and see what was actually there. It took us a bit of time and research to locate where we needed to go and how to actually find the location. This was mostly due to the fact that this base is located in the middle of a heavily forested area. Closed off by several fences and gates, we were only able to find it because my one friend John noticed a little sign sticking out of a dirt driveway that said, no trespassing. If we hadn't seen that, we probably would have never have stumbled upon the base. The sign looked old and very worn down, so we ignored it and proceeded to head in what we thought was the right direction. We drove down a dirt road for a minute or two, until we approached a closed gate that we were unable to get by with the car. This gate was also covered with no trespassing and no entry under government law signs. My friends and I had a little debate as to whether we should go any further or just turn back. My friend John and I were arguing to push forward and see what we could find, while the others were a little more reluctant. But we eventually agreed that we had come this far and we wanted to see what we could find. John got out of his driver's side door and manually lifted up the gate so we could pass through and continue moving forward. After John got back in the car, we drove for another five minutes. The road was full of twists and turns and barely went straight for more than a few seconds. Through the light flurries of snow out the window, we could see all sorts of stuff on the side of the road. We drove fairly slowly to try to make out everything that was lying on the ground. There were beds, dressers, and boxes of what seemed to be unopened food. Everything was becoming ruined from the light snow on the ground. It was a weird sight to see because... None of the items looked like garbage or trash. It looked fairly new. Perhaps it had just been placed there recently. After a couple of more minutes, we finally reached the end of the road and arrived at what we assumed was the abandoned base. It was strange looking and not really what you would expect when you think of a military base. There were three separate buildings. 
The one closest to us was a big building that almost looked like an old apartment building. There were rows of uniform windows that seemed to go around the building. The building right next to it was a tall building with a huge satellite dish on the roof. It wasn't very wide, but was the tallest of the three buildings by at least five stories. Lastly, the third building looked like a church. It was an average-sized building with two double doors in the front, each door sporting a large cross on it, hence why I assumed it was a church of some kind. All three buildings did truly look abandoned. They were covered with vines and moss up the side. It definitely appeared as if the structures had been untouched for many years. We all sat in the car with this feeling of uneasiness. None of us really sure if we were going to get in trouble for being here and if the property was routinely monitored so we would get caught. Despite all the warning signs, we kept telling ourselves it was abandoned and that we were probably the only ones there and we wouldn't get into trouble. Finally, John opened his door and said, I didn't come this far to sit in the car. I'm going to look around. Trying not to seem scared, I decided to go with him. Our two other friends were pretty scared at this point and decided to stay in the car. John and I went into the first building. The door was unlocked and, of course, the lights didn't work inside. We were using flashlights that I brought to navigate throughout the building. It was a strange and almost surreal feeling walking through the hallways. It was freezing and every little noise made us jump. But what was really creepy is that the place looked like it was actually abandoned all of a sudden out of nowhere. All the beds were still made, the dressers still shut. There were even pictures and art hanging on some of the walls. We decided we had seen enough and moved on to the second building with a large satellite. The door to this building was locked tight. We banged on it pretty hard, but the door wasn't budging at all. We walked around the entire building, but we didn't see another entrance, so we gave up and went to the third and final building. Now, it's worth noting at this point, I had become a little paranoid and jumpy. I kept hearing noises that I would dismiss as nothing, but I had that pit in my stomach feeling that something just wasn't right. I felt like we weren't the only ones there and that we were going to get caught and get into massive amounts of trouble. We approached the church and the door was unlocked. We walked in and immediately noticed the mess. There were books and papers everywhere littered across the floor. I tried picking up a few papers to read them, but it all just seemed like military code that I couldn't understand, just an assortment of numbers and letters that made up a certain pattern. The inside of the building didn't have any kind of religious paraphernalia in it other than just one cross on the back wall. Just as we were getting ready to leave, John noticed a door in the floor that seemed to lead to a basement or a lower level of the building. John and I looked at each other with curiosity. I knew deep down we shouldn't open it, but my curiosity got the best of me. We opened the door and it was a ladder that went down a hallway that seemed to have lights or some source of brightness. We went down and started to walk through a long hallway that was lit up with orange lights, much like you might see in a parking garage. After about 30 seconds, we made it to the end of the hallway where there was a door with a small window on it. There was a lot of light coming from the window. We walked up to it and slowly peeked in. To our shock, there was eight or so men, all in suits, sitting around a table. We only looked in for a few seconds when one of the men turned his head and noticed us in the hallway outside of the door. We ducked immediately trying not to bring attention to ourselves, but before we knew it, the orange lights in the hallway had turned red. We started to run as fast as we could knowing we stumbled across something we weren't supposed to. As we were coming up the ladder in the church, we could hear what sounded like a door slam and people running down the hall. Knowing the amount of trouble that we were in, we ran as fast as we could to the others. We got into the car and drove out of the area as fast as we could. Once we turned back onto the main road, we could see headlights shining through the heavily wooded area. At least we thought they were headlights. They could have also been flashlights. After this night, the four of us felt like we were walking on eggshells for what seemed like months. We figured it was only a matter of time before they found us or the cops would show up at our door knowing what we had done. I've been out of high school for 12 years now and... Nothing of note regarding this incident has happened to me or any of my friends. I'm not sure what we found that night. John thought it was some kind of secret government base, but I don't think you can just walk into an active base unnoticed like that. It seemed a little too official to be a cult, but then again, I don't have much cult experience, so I'm not sure what happened that night. 
It's been almost 12 years since this occurred, and I wanted to finally share my story and see what people think. What was all of that, and should I still be scared and looking over my shoulder? The events of this story happened to me about two years ago in the middle of December. I remember it because it was about two weeks before my birthday. I was working as a nighttime janitor for a church about 15 minutes away from home. It was a pretty simple job for the most part, but once every six months or so, I would have to do an overnight shift when we did a deep clean of the church. We usually did this once during the winter and once during the summer. Part of the job was to get ready for the winter holiday season. I was responsible for retrieving all of the Christmas and winter decorations from the basement of the church. It is just about as boring as it sounds, but wasn't very difficult for decent pay. The church was very big and old-fashioned, and to my knowledge it hadn't been updated in decades. It has many rows of pews adorned with antique religious statues and artifacts. In the far left corner of the church behind the altar was a small door that led down into the storage basement. On the right side of the altar was another door, and this door led into a small kitchen. The evening started normal, just like any other overnight shift that I had in the past. The first thing I did was get all the decorations and winter items that needed to be hung and installed throughout the church from that basement. It's important to note here that I locked this door after going into the basement. I had a bit of OCD, especially when it comes to my job, and I always check to make sure I locked up when I finished. After getting all of the decorations, I spent a few hours sweeping and then mopping the entire floor of the church. It was about 3am by then and I had to do a few last things before I could leave, including vacuuming the carpet that was on the altar. While vacuuming, I thought I heard a loud noise from the back of the church, something like a pipe or a ladder falling to the floor. Not seeing anything and figuring it was just nothing, I looked back down and continued vacuuming. Just before finishing, I heard another loud noise. At this point, I was admittedly a little startled. I thought maybe I had left the church door open, which isn't like me. Maybe if I left the door open, someone had wandered in. It was really cold out, and it wouldn't be the first time someone had wandered inside just to try and get warm. So I cautiously approached the door and was reassured that the door was in fact locked, and that wasn't where the noise had come from. As I started walking back toward the altar, I noticed that the basement door was now wide open, and the entire area was freezing all of a sudden, like a window was open right in front of me. Even though the church was very old, it was usually always warm inside, and for some reason it was freezing. I swear I could see my breath. I decided I had to go check the basement out since the door was now open, and I was sure that I had locked it. Perhaps the lock was broken and the door was able to swing open. As soon as I got to the basement, I almost threw up due to the putrid smell. It smelled like spoiled or rotten meat. It was honestly the most repulsive smell I have encountered in my entire life. Now remember, I was just down there a couple of hours ago and it didn't smell at all, and it wasn't cold. At this point, I was really struggling to put the pieces together. Had a stray animal somehow gotten in? A skunk, perhaps? After a moment of walking around the basement for a few minutes, the light suddenly began to flicker and actually went out completely. I used the light on my cell phone to navigate the freezing basement. I reached one of the corners of the basement to find a pool of black sludge. It was really thick like blood but appeared to be jet black. While I was examining the pile of sludge to see if that was giving off the smell, maybe a bursted pipe. I heard another loud bang similar to those I thought I heard earlier in the night. I turned and looked back at the stairs and began to make my way back up them, and there appeared to be some kind of shadow at the top of the stairs. It looked like the shadow of a dog or an animal of similar size, sitting down on the floor. I shouted at the shadow, but it didn't move at all. I was yelling in hopes that the figure would become more clear and I could make some sense of what was going on. I ran up the stairs toward the shadow and as I reached the top, there was nothing. I couldn't even find anything that was making the shadow. I turned and locked the basement and as I walked off the altar I noticed that the big cross that sits on the front of the table was now on the ground. 
Well, at least that explained the bang that I had heard moments earlier. As I went to pick up the cross, I felt a burn on my forearm, and as I yelled in pain and dropped the cross, I noticed that I had a small scratch on my arm. That was the final straw for me. I locked the church doors and left right then and there, not questioning my decision. When I was asked why I was given notice and leaving the job, I provided no explanation. I didn't want to recount those acts to co-workers and superiors. I've reached out to mediums and other types of professionals who specialize in this area, but unfortunately I've been told I don't have enough physical evidence to determine what this could have been. Using the internet for research, the events that transpired that night seemed to be involved with those of a demon or a demon possession. But how could this be? Surely that type of entity wouldn't be able to survive or even enter a church. Either way, I have tried to move on from the traumatic events of that evening and thankfully have not had another experience like it since. If anyone has any information or experience with a similar situation, please let me know. The story happened to me approximately seven years ago. For the better part of my adult life, I have been somewhat of a loner. I don't have many friends and have never been married. After college, I moved to a small city that is home to a lot of rural areas and forests. I have always been drawn to nature, so this was a perfect living situation for me. I was able to partake in all of my hobbies like hiking, kayaking, camping, and so forth. My job luckily allowed me to work from home, so whenever I wasn't working on coding inside, I was out on a trail or exploring some new area that I hadn't previously been to. On this particular night, it was a bitter cold evening. During the winter, I had grown accustomed to hiking to the lake located in the main forest near my house. The lake was very large and I don't ever recall it freezing completely. From what I was told, there was a huge salt deposit in the bottom of the lake which kept it from icing over. Another interesting fact about the lake is that Nobody knows for sure if it was man-made or natural. There are apparently arguments for both cases. As I started to slowly close in on the lake, I thought that I could see someone up ahead. This wasn't abnormal as there was several major trails that could take you to and from the lake. I began to make my way closer, but I was moving much slower as I was trying to focus my eyes in the darkness. As I got closer, I could see that there was a figure about 30 feet away from me just looming and staring directly at the lake. They weren't moving and had their face fixated on the lake. The figure was tall, well over 6 foot and very skinny. The figure appeared to be naked or at least wasn't wearing a shirt. Their head was elongated and round on top. Whatever I was looking at was certainly not human, but humanoid in nature. Paralyzed by a mixture of fear and intrigue, I just stared at the figure hoping I wouldn't be noticed. I was trying to squint and get a better look so I could figure out what I was looking at. After a few moments of silence, another figure walked up to the one that was already standing there. At this point, I could see the entire side profile of the humanoid creature. Its legs were long and they kind of shot out slowly as they walked. Its eyes were larger than normal and took up a larger area of the creature's face. The figures both looked at each other. They were moving their arms and bodies as if though they were communicating but weren't making any noise. Before I knew it, I was forced to clench my hands over my ears. I heard a loud blast followed by a high-pitched ringing that forced me to my knees. Once the noise stopped, the creatures were gone. I slowly made my way over to the lake where I thought I saw them standing to search for any kind of evidence of what I saw. Unfortunately, there was none. I saw no footprints or anything else that looked strange and out of place. I spent the rest of that night staring at the stars trying to understand what I saw and what I had just experienced. Maybe these creatures liked the cold winter night. Perhaps they were attracted and drawn to the salt water. Either way... I know I saw something that wasn't human that night. Was it some sort of shapeshifter? Was it extraterrestrial? Or perhaps it was something even more sinister like a demon trying to take human form. I'm just happy I was able to live through this experience without finding out. Hey friends, thanks for listening. 
be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, or let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.